امروز ملت ایران یک ملت صاحب فناوری هسته است و کسانی که با ملت ما میخوان حرف بزنند باید بدانند که با کدوم ملت دارن حرف میزنند اگر هم الان ندانن به زودی مجددن زمانی که سرشون به سنگ خواهد خورد From Tehran to the United Nations in New York President Ahmadinejad expresses his distaste for America and the international community. Media outlets line up for interviews with a defiant Iranian president, as daily news reports focus on Iran's nuclear program. American and Western leaders have often labeled the Iranian regime a sponsor of terror and a violator of human rights. Yet, for more than 30 years, America has misread the guiding principles of the Islamic Republic. What happens when a regime that openly desires the destruction of nations obtains nuclear weapons? The world may suffer unthinkable consequences. Iran's nuclear program is not an isolated problem. It is the final component of an extreme doctrine that has held Iran's citizens and the international community hostage for more than 30 years. The threat America and the world face from Iran today can be traced back to 1978. At the time, Iran was ruled by the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, a longtime ally of the United States. Iran is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. The Shah was rapidly modernizing Iran introducing secularism and capitalism to a traditional Muslim society. There always is uh, this tug of war uh, in the Middle East between authenticity and uh, what you might call cultural collaboration with the West. Within Iran, the Shah was viewed as an uncompromising dictator. Growing distaste quickly turned into public outrage. Rightists and leftists from all across Iranian society, including Marxists, communists, and religious elements, formed a popular revolution to overthrow the Shah. And one man emerged as the leader of the movement. Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, living in exile in the suburbs of Paris, had been one of the main opponents of the Shah since the 1960s and offered promises of political freedom. Khomeini was able to ride this, this wave of, you know, an enormous dissatisfaction, frustration, and expectation. They had no idea who he was, but when they began to see that he had power, they naturally began to gravitate towards him. After months of violent street protests, the U.S. withdrew its support of the Shah. Now we know the United States has passed the word to the Shah of Iran. It's time for him to leave his country. The fact that Jimmy Carter did not support the Shah in the time of his difficulties actually signaled to the Iranian people that the Shah's rule was over. In February 1979, the Shah left Iran, never to return. Two weeks later, Khomeini triumphantly arrived in Tehran as a hero. For Khomeini, the Shah was gone, 
but the Western influence he promoted was still present across Iranian society. America would soon become Khomeini's next adversary. In their perception, the leading power of the world of the unbelievers is the United States. And the United States is therefore inevitably the main enemy. America is the great Satan because from their point of view, it is the enemy of God. We are Satan whispering into the ears of the Muslims, trying to tempt them away from Islam. For years during our school in Iran, our teachers and the government, they told us the Americans are devils. They will kill us. Every morning, they forced us to just chant death to America. <laughs> It didn't take long for the regime to discover a model for fighting against American interests. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. The Americans inside have been taken prisoner. Just nine months after Khomeini's return, several hundred students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, taking 63 Americans hostage. The first major American mistake was in the handling of the hostage crisis. At that time, the response was, to put it mildly, feeble. Everything that Carter did showed to the Iranian mind's weakness. They said, oh boy, America's weak. Let's push on. I don't know how much longer we can sit here and uh, see them kept captive while the uh, situation around them uh, does uh, deteriorate. We are not afraid of the regime. The thing that we are afraid of is the government. The crisis stretched on for 444 days, emboldening Khomeini and further strengthening his popular support. The hostages were not released until January 20th, 1981. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. Khomeini understood that Ronald Reagan would be a different kind of a president than Jimmy Carter had been. There probably was a measure of wariness about his approach to Iran and an understanding that he would not put up with the assault on American sovereignty that Jimmy Carter had put up with. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free. At the time of the revolution, most Iranians and Westerners alike didn't fully understand Khomeini's guiding principles and the vision he had in store for Iran and the world. Khomeini was seeking what he called an Islamic revolution to establish the, the, the rule of Iran and the world as a whole. His goal was to uh, eradicate the old regime and replace it with a pure Islamic regime. <laughs> Iranians, by a reported 60 to 1 margin, have approved a referendum creating an Islamic state and giving Ayatollah Khomeini undisputed powers as theocratic leader for life. Most of the states in the Muslim world, those that have written constitutions, say something about Islam being the religion of the state or the Sharia being a part of a system of law. In Iran, it goes much beyond that. Bayat. The constitution Khomeini canonized guides Iran's leaders to this day. نهضت برای اسلام نمیتوند محصور باشد در یک کشور. و نمیتوند محصور باشد 
در حتی کشورهای اسلامی اسلام برای شما خوب است برای دنیا تون خوب است اگر آخرت هم قبول ندارید برای دنیا تون خوب است It has nothing to do with nationalism, with the people of Iran, with the Iran as a country, with none of those things. It's the ideology of Islamism, period. For over 30 years, the regime has used international terror in its struggle to spread Khomeini's revolution. When you look at Iranian government terrorism, what you understand is that from the very beginning of this regime, in January of 1979, they considered terrorism as a tool of policy. We know that Iran is the leading uh, sponsor and supporter of terrorism around the world. The Iranian regime has an endless number of proxy organizations, beginning with the big ones, such as uh, Hezbollah. Iran set up Hezbollah early on to have a cutout, somebody who could uh, independently carry out terrorist attacks with, quote, no fingerprints back to Tehran. Founded in the early 80s in Lebanon under the guidance of Ayatollah Khomeini, Hezbollah wasted little time before striking American installations. The day after this attack on the embassy here in Beirut, the death toll has continued to climb. It is believed that before the counting is over, more than 60 people will be found to have died at least 16 of them Americans. Hezbollah's next attack would prove even more deadly, attacking multinational peacekeeping forces stationed in Beirut following Lebanon's civil war. At that point, this had been the largest non-nuclear explosion ever recorded. We worked for four days trying to find people who were buried, and then we continued to work just to find pieces of bodies, to put them together, every piece of a body we wanted to bury, and not just leave the bodies under the rubble. Their intention in attacking us in Beirut was to drive the United States out of Lebanon and ultimately out of the Middle East. Despite repeated proclamations that terrorists won't affect US foreign policy, Muslim forces in Lebanon achieve their goal when Reagan withdraws all 1,400 Marines to the safety of offshore ships. When we pulled our troops out, we essentially sent a message to the Iranians, you win. We will respond to terrorism by retreating. It was a terrible message to send, and we've been paying the price for that ever since. You've got a whole series of hostage takings in the 1980s, you had attacks in the early 1990s, 1992, Buenos Aires against the Israeli embassy, 1994 against the Jewish Cultural Center in Buenos Aires, 1996 against Kobar Towers, 1998, Iran was involved with Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah in the East Africa embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. In the year 2000, Iran was involved with Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda again against the USS Cole. You've got the attacks against Riyadh and so forth. We know from the 9-11 Commission report that Iran provided substantial material support to the hijackers who would launch the 9-11 attacks in the United States. There's clearly a direct connection between uh, the Iranian uh, petroleum and gas industry and its support for global terrorism. They send that money to Hamas in Gaza, and they send that money to Nasrallah of Lebanon. Hezbollah in Lebanon used to receive $300 million a year. After 2006, according to open sources, uh, they have been receiving close to $1 billion a year. They work with just about every Islamist terrorist group in the, in the world. More recently, Iran has supported militant actions against US troops fighting in the region. Iran has not been uh, really very subtle about confronting us in Iraq. It is increasingly apparent to both coalition and Iraqi leaders that Iran, through the use of the Quds Force, 
seeks to turn the Iraqi special groups into a Hezbollah-like force to serve its interests and fight a proxy war against the Iraqi state and coalition forces in Iraq. Highly sophisticated weapons known as explosively formed penetrators or EFPs can be directly tied to Tehran. They are responsible for at least the deaths of 500 Americans and now they're moving them over to Afghanistan. Iran has gone beyond giving weapons to the Taliban. The Iranians are helping train Taliban fighters in the use of small arms and are doing some of that training inside Iran. When they provide training and equipment to people fighting us in Iraq and Afghanistan, you'd have to say that they are at war with us. Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini was the one who sparked the current wave of global Islamic terrorism through the Islamic Revolution of 1979. <laughs> Khomeini came as a supreme leader with the power of God. His power was above the Constitution. The first month that the new regime came in, they murdered 3,500 officers of the Shah's army. Within two to three years, they had murdered 100,000 people in Iran for political reasons. Khomeini was behind all of the terrorist attacks against the United States. He was behind the taking of US hostages, the French hostages. He was behind the creation of Hezbollah in Lebanon. He was behind the murder of dissidents all around the world. The very first killing was right here in Washington, DC, just a couple of months after the revolution. But after that, the Iranians moved mainly to Europe. They killed Shapur Bakhtiar, former prime minister in Paris. They killed Gassamlu in Vienna, Austria. The famous Mykonos killings in 1992 in Germany. It was worldwide, wherever they could track down their opponents, they would kill them. When Khomeini died in 1989, one of his most loyal followers, Ali Khamenei, became supreme leader. Right now we have a leader, his name is Ayatollah Khamenei, who is really, really a brutal person and a dictator. You have thousands of people rounded up, some because they demonstrate, some because they blog, some because they're women and didn't cover all their hair or all their bodies, and they're thrown in jail and frequently tortured and often executed. Under Khamenei, Iran still imposes the occasional death by stoning for women convicted of adultery. Iranian women don't have custody of their children. They can't divorce their husbands. Their husbands can marry whoever they want to. There have been women in Iran who have been hung for the crime of being raped. A woman who is a virgin, if she is executed, will go to paradise. And so they rape her before they execute her, because that way they can guarantee that she will not enter paradise. Khamenei's hold on power is made possible by a powerful and loyal military force. Who are the people holding power in Iran? Well, the clerics, the Guardian Council, but the men who actually rule on a day-to-day -day basis are the men with the guns, the Revolutionary Guard and the Basij. These are the ideologically committed shock troops of the Islamic Republic. The mandate of the IRGC is spelled out quite specifically in the Iranian constitution that the IRGC is constituted as a religious army. Not only does the Constitution say its mission is jihad, it quotes the Quran in verse 860, which says, uh, strike terror into the hearts of the enemy. One member of the Revolutionary Guards was Reza Khalili, who secretly passed information to the CIA. He now disguises his identity living in the United States. The Revolutionary Guards were formed initially to secure the country against any coups or potential takeovers. But the guards expanded from there immediately. Today, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, or IRGC, has 125,000 fighters, with tens of thousands of additional members in its paramilitary wings. They took hold of the financial parts of the country. They expanded into terrorism. They expanded into the foreign ministry, where they were sent as diplomats to Iranian consulates and embassies. 
General Petraeus said Iran's ambassador in Baghdad, also a part of Iran's Al-Quds force. The Quds force controls the, the policy for Iraq. They have their own intelligence service, their own university, their own businesses. They control an enormous amount of, uh, of Iranian industry, including the oil business. The IRGC is so deeply entrenched in Iran's economy and commercial enterprises, it is increasingly, increasingly likely that if you are doing business with Iran, you are doing business with the IRGC. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is particularly loyal to the mandate of the Revolutionary Guards. Ahmadinejad started with the Revolutionary Guards. He rose up to ranks by proving to the regime that he was a true believer. The regime wanted a president who would reveal the regime in all of its nastiness, and that was Ahmadinejad, and therefore they had him elected. We talked for uh, many years that he was just a front and the real power is the mullahs. The reality is this, whether it's the mullahs that are calling the shot or the president of Iran calling the shot, their remarks are the same. Ahmadinejad narrative is very strange for all of us. Um, he seems from another planet. Uh, he talks about a world without America. Imam Aziz, farmudi kebayat mustachbirin jahan منهدم شوند و به لطف استمرار خط نورانیت در ولایت و به فضل الهی زنگ شمارش معکوس از محلال قدرت اهریمنی آمریکا به صدا در آمده است The Iranian regime will use whatever means it can to try to export the revolution. They believe that uh, they should export these ideas first to Islamic countries to make uh, Islamic Republic in every Islamic country and then export that to a whole the world. The revolution succeeded in bringing radical Islamic fundamentalism throughout the Muslim world. Since its inception, the Khomeinist regime of Iran was already building what became later its international alliance of the 21st century. By the mid-80s, Iran has already reached the eastern Mediterranean, Syria, Hezbollah, and as of the 90s, Hamas inside the Palestinian communities. Today, we look at eastern Arabia. We look at northern Yemen and southern Saudi Arabia. The Iranians have been accused of providing support for the Houthis and using them in a proxy war against Yemen's Sunni Muslim majority. The way events are moving in this country indicates to us that Iran wants to export the Shia ideology by force. We look even into Africa, West Africa. We look nowadays into Latin America from uh, Caracas, from Venezuela, all the way down to Argentina. Iran has made a conscious decision to infiltrate the Western Hemisphere in Latin America. It's pretty clear that they've also looked at other countries in Central and South America, trying to line up a group of like-minded people who have as a primary goal sticking it uh, in the United States' eye and working against our interests wherever they are. There has been a truly dangerous and alarming alliance formed between the Islamic Republic of Iran and Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. We ask the world to respect Iran because they are trying to influence the strength of the Iranian revolution. The Iranian regime and Hugo Chavez signed strategic treaties. That is a reminder of the Soviet Union and Cuba. We know that the uh, Iranian cells and Hezbollah, their allies, have cells throughout the Western world. So it's really a global reach at this point in time. The ability of Iran to come into the hemisphere uh, is something that, uh, that we are concerned about because of Iran's support for terrorism. The Iranian strategy is not necessarily to have Iranian troops occupying these countries. That would be too obvious. With petrodollars, unlike the Soviet Union, the Iranians could go across any border. Iran has bought itself the support of a third of humanity by signing huge energy deals with China and India. They have a way to buy the support of countries that are extremely important on the world stage. China emerged as Iran's top oil export market. Iran provides 300,000 barrels of oil a day to China, generating billions of dollars in revenue. 
with the petrodollars pouring in from Iran, that money could create a lot of influences. Ayam Enqila, Ayam Jahanist, dar geografiya va zaman mahdud nemi shavad. Tardid nakonid ke, inshallah, Islam, hamiy kujar fat fat ke, hamiy kullahay jahan ro fat khah. Today, the Iranian regime is on the verge of becoming a nuclear power. In 1968, Iran, under the Shah's leadership, signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and began working on a nuclear energy program. With the overthrow of the Shah, the Iranian nuclear program went into remission. At the time, Khomeini didn't value the potential of Iran's energy program. But within a few years, circumstances would change. With well over half a million Iranians dead and Khomeini refusing a ceasefire agreement, the regime decided to secretly restart Iran's nuclear program. The details of the program would eventually become the subject of international scrutiny and debate. Iran commits under the Non-Proliferation Treaty not to do anything that would lead to the development of nuclear weapons. It pledges to be a non-nuclear weapons state. It's entitled to, under the treaty, to peaceful civil nuclear power, and there is an ambiguity there. Yet, Iran is one country that may never need another source of energy. Iran sits on enormous reserves of uh, fairly clean burning uh, and super cheap natural gas. They're arguing they need to make fuel to be independent. It doesn't add up. Iran is entitled to a nuclear energy program if it abides by its treaty requirements. The IAEA Director General's latest report once again concludes that Iran is not complying with its IAEA and Security Council obligations. We have no secrecy. And we work within the framework of the IAEA. How many more lie buried? That's the question for Iran tonight. After revealing it had been concealing a second secret nuclear enrichment facility. One of the things the Iranians learned from the North Koreans was to bury their facilities, hiding them from the view of satellites and overhead imagery. More and more of these clandestine sites are coming to light, but it has to be understood that the network of Iran's nuclear weapons program is quite large, and there must be many, many sites that are not disclosed so far. Another cause for alarm is Iran's unexplained enrichment of uranium and plutonium, well beyond the levels necessary for a peaceful nuclear energy program. And Iran is in the news tonight. Nuclear experts have found unexplained traces of plutonium and highly enriched uranium in a nuclear waste facility in Iran. Iran is in enriching uranium, and we don't have any, any explanation for the use of this enriched uranium. No matter how many resolutions are passed, Islamic Republic of Iran will not stop its enrichment activities. You are not going after a nuclear bomb. Iran is definitely not. We hate this weapon. The IRGC reached out to the Pakistani so-called father of the bomb, A.Q. Khan, and obtained blueprints for warhead design. We know that they have laboratories that are working on some kind of high explosive dash implosion work. Recently uncovered documents have revealed the development of detonation devices. The document talks of a four-year Iranian program to develop a neutron initiator, a highly specialized component of a nuclear detonator. This had no civil application. The only conclusion we could reach is that this was part of a plan to develop at least the capability to be able to build this part for a nuclear weapons program. For years, the Iranian government has failed to live up to its obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It has violated its commitments to the International Atomic Energy Agency. It has ignored UN Security Council resolutions. And while Iran's leaders hide behind outlandish rhetoric, 
Their actions have been deeply troubling. It's not just a failure of the non-proliferation treaty, but rather the fact that a dangerous regime committed to the Islamic Jihad in the world is now coming into possession of deliverable nuclear weapons. If Iran develops a nuclear weapon, even a small, very primitive one that they just detonate uh, in the desert and have a small mushroom cloud and some radioactivity, that makes them a nuclear power, even one test. The leverage that they gain once they have the capability changes the balance in the region and around the world uh, without even having to use the weapon. It could uh, essentially hold uh, hostage other states uh, to its desires. The Iranians could tell their neighbors, you will not export X, Y, and Z, or a certain amount of oil. And um, the regimes are going to have to say, yes, sir. Crude prices have now breached the $120 a barrel level for various reasons. The markets are worried about the disruption in supplies from Iran. When these countries disrupt oil supplies or cause volatility or even issue warnings about what they're going to do in response to certain uh, foreign policy actions, that causes a great deal of volatility in the oil market, causes prices to go up. War games in the Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz, a crucial waterway for the movement of global oil exports. Nearly half of the world's oil supply travels on ship through the Strait of Hormuz the narrow gateway to the Persian Gulf along Iran's coast. Iran has said if attacked, it could close the Strait of Hormuz. They could theoretically, and with a surface missile, cover the straits and destroy ships going through there. The temporary cutoff under those uh, circumstances would be something that would uh, shove the price of oil uh, very high. Iranian nuclear weapons can significantly limit the ability to counter attacks on shipping lanes and to provide protection to surrounding nations. Newly leaked diplomatic cables posted on WikiLeaks show Middle East powers like Saudi Arabia don't trust Iran and fear that Iran will soon threaten them with a nuclear bomb. Similar comments came from the leaders of Bahrain and UAE. Iran's neighbors are looking for reassurance that we will be there for them if something goes wrong. And frankly, they're very scared that we won't be. These regimes want to survive. And that means that if we will not be there, they have to look elsewhere. A nuclear-armed Iran with a deliverable uh, weapons system uh, is going to spark an arms race in uh, the Middle East and the greater region. Countries in that region who must protect themselves and their people will begin to, to want to acquire their own capability. We'll have another nuclear arms race with all kinds of undemocratic countries getting nuclear weapons, and we'll have the Saudis wanting it, the Egyptians wanting it, and other countries as well. If we have a program in Iran, we will see that this program will be a result تهديدا للاستقرار في الشرق الاوسط لانه سوف يدفع باطراف جديده للدخول في المجال النووي العسكري. While Iran poses a threat to countries across the region, one nation has been singled out above the rest. اسرائيل یک قده سرطانی است. خب قده سرطانی رو چه کار میکنن؟ غیر از قطع قده چه علاجی میتوان برای او کرد؟ Taking aim once again at Israel, Ahmadinejad told an audience that, quote, this origin of corruption will soon be wiped off the Earth's face. You have a president of Iran that threatens to wipe a democracy and one of America's strongest allies on the planet, wipe it from the map. Now, if that isn't a wake-up call to the rest of the world, I don't know what is. Whenever Iran has developed a new weapon that can be used against Israel. They've shipped it to Hezbollah. Now those missiles give Iran, through Hezbollah, the capability of hitting any target in Israel and hitting it with a very large warhead. Once the Iranian missiles are up and running on launching pads in Lebanon, they can reach not just Israel, they can reach Western targets. So we are talking about an expansion of Iran in the entire eastern Mediterranean region, something that has not happened even during the Cold War under the Soviet threat. In 1998, the Iranians carried out a test 
to launch a Scud missile from a barge in the Caspian Sea. Many people believe that uh, this is what the Iranians would like to do with the United States, put a missile in a cargo ship going off of our coast and uh, attack Baltimore, attack New York, attack Washington, D.C. From 100 miles off our coast, we'd never see it. You can put it on a ship, and you can sail that ship into New York Harbor and blow it up. You have no real way of stopping that, because how do you know which of the thousands of ships that move around has that device on it? 95% of U.S. trade is handled at ports similar to this one on New York Staten Island. But only 5% of these containers are visually inspected. They could use such a weapon in some covert way, say, uh, on a Hezbollah crewed fishing boat in some port somewhere in the world. Another scenario, uh, it clearly, is to bring a small, man-portable nuclear weapon, a backpack nuclear weapon, across the Mexican border, which, as most Americans understand, is not very well protected. Hezbollah has been uh, making uh, linkages with Mexican drug cartels, not to compete with them in narcotics trade, but rather to use their already established channels of entry into the United States, up from Mexico, through the United States and all the way on up even into Canada. The terrorist organization Hezbollah has been using Mexican drug smuggling routes to enter the U.S. Correct. It is the same Hezbollah that is funded by Iran. These are wings of Hezbollah criminal enterprises working in Latin America. They can certainly sneak over radioactive material. They can sneak over people. It's just that easy. No question that identifying and tracking uh, Hezbollah here inside the United States is a very high priority of the FBI. Tomorrow, you could have Hezbollah attacking the United States in the, in the United States. If Iran has nuclear weapons, do you see the president of the United States calling up in Tehran and saying, you've just attacked us, we're going to launch uh, a counterstrike on your territory? I can hear Ahmadinejad or another Iranian president saying, well, Mr. President, make my day. The United States is extremely vulnerable. We're just, we're an open society. We're spread out. We have harbors, we have two coasts, we have rivers. And we are susceptible, susceptible to a deadly attack, either by terrorists with a nuclear weapon provided by Iran, or by some delivery system they managed to cobble together, whether it's conventional or EMP or whatever it is. When Mahmoud Ahmadinejad talks about a world without America not only being desirable but achievable, he could mean probably one thing, and that is what's known as a strategic electromagnetic pulse attack. An electromagnetic pulse weapon is essentially a nuclear weapon that is exploded in the atmosphere up above. It doesn't hit the ground, it's exploded up in the air. It sends out pulse waves, shock waves. You have to understand what this pulse is. It's tremendously high energy. Every wire will pick up this pulse, take the energy, and burn out whatever's at the end. An EMP weapon, meaning a small nuclear bomb, detonated above the center of the United States would literally take down the entire power grid of this country. Not only would the power grid be out, it would be out for probably months, but every piece of electronics that we use, from pacemakers to phones to cars to gasoline pumps to water pumps, would all be fried. The Blue Ribbon Commission established by the Congress concluded that this was an eminently achievable way of effecting catastrophic effects on the United States, specifically devastating the electrical grid of this country, and with it all of the infrastructures that depend upon it, food, water, sewage, medical, commercial, financial, transportation. According to the chairman of this Blue Ribbon Commission, within a year, nine out of 10 Americans would be dead as a result of exposure, starvation, disease. This country would cease to exist as we know it. When you combine that with the stated purpose of bringing about a world without America, it's a very dangerous set of developments. There is a, a sort of cultural relativism in the West which makes, it, makes people reluctant to condemn, particularly to condemn another civilization. We must be nice to them. We must be tolerant, we must be understanding, and so forth. But this should not go to the level of blinding ourselves to the more painful realities of the situation. Americans and Europeans are really uncomfortable with the idea of holy wars 
and mass murder for religious reasons. They can't imagine themselves slaughtering other human beings because the true religion needs to defeat the enemies of God. Because they can't imagine that for themselves, they also can't imagine that others behave that way. But this is a failure of imagination. این نهضت باید زنده بماند و زنده ماندنش به این خون ریزه هاست بریزید خون ها را If you have the profound strongly held religious beliefs and you send people to the deaths you are you're doing them a favor you're giving them a quick free pass to heaven and all its delights and we saw that during the Iraq Iran war when they were willing to send hundreds of children to walk into the minefields to clear them for them. The red headbands of this martyr's brigade promise immediate entry into heaven. No small consideration for these youths who may be called upon to walk through Iraqi minefields. Human detectors clearing the way for tanks and regular troops. Waves of young boys who volunteered to become martyrs, clearing minefields by running across them. در فرهنگ ما در منطق ما شهادت در همین سطح از اعتبار نخواهد توانست بر جمهوری اسلامی و ملت ایران فائق بیاد و کدوم هنرمندی و هنرنمایی زیباتر و الهی تر و ماندگار تر از هنر شهادت اصلا ملتی که شهادت داره اسارت نداره اونایی که میخوان اینو بزنن دارن پایه های استقلال و امنیت ملی ما رو میزنن پایه های ماندگاری ما رو میزنن این اسلام از این کریستیانیتی از این جودیزم there is what you might call an end of time scenario in which the Mahdi the descendant of the prophet returns and leads the forces of the true believers in the final struggle against the forces of the unbelievers now what is really alarming is that from the pronouncements, particular of Ahmadinejad and others of his group, they believe that that time is now, that this is the end of time, that this is the final struggle. Anybody who tells you that we shouldn't take this seriously is not looking at the individuals who are in power, who are ruling Iran today. They believe that by creating apocalyptic conditions that they will bring the Mahdi back. Every speech that Ahmadinejad gives, whether it's at the United Nations in New York or in Tehran or in Mashhad or someplace else, begins with this. He says, let my words and my actions hasten the return of the 12th Imam. O oh God, hasten the arrival of Imam al-Mahdi and grant him good health and victory and make us his followers and those who attest to his rightfulness. Khamenei, Ahmadinejad, and some of the others truly believe that they've been put on earth in order to lead the Muslim world in a glorious jihad against uh, the infidels and establish the rule of the 12th Imam on earth. They really, in this cult, believe that they ought to try to get him back so they can have the battles that will end the world and send all them in their view to heaven and the rest of us to hell. What makes that particularly alarming is the whole question of nuclear weapons. During the Cold War, both the United States and the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. But they didn't use them, and then they knew that they wouldn't use them because of what we used to call at that time MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction. Each side knew that if they used nuclear weapons, the others would respond in kind, and this would obliterate everybody. With these people, with their apocalyptic mindset, Mutual Assured Destruction is not a deterrent, it's an inducement. Deterrence is not likely to work since it's their purpose to bring about uh, this calamity rather than to avoid it. At the current time, and not once during the past 31 years of the existence of this regime, has the United States possessed the willpower to do anything about the Iranian regime in Tehran? I think President Carter felt that he could uh, deal with the Iranians. It turned out he couldn't. Ronald Reagan I thought he could. It turned out that he couldn't. Clinton, through Bush and now Obama, have all believed that there was some level of benefits that Iran could be offered that would get it to give up its nuclear uh, program. I don't think that one can proceed with this regime by negotiation. They regard this attempt or desire to negotiate 
as a sign of fear and weakness. There is only one thing that the Iranian regime is seeking from negotiations over its nuclear weapons program with the West, and that's time to complete its weapons and its arsenal. The regime in Tehran is determined to acquire nuclear weapons, and there are no carrots that the United States or anyone else can offer that's going to get them to give that uh, program up before they achieve the objective. Recognizing that diplomacy may fail, the Obama administration is considering alternative strategies. Secretary Gates told the White House in January it had no effective strategy in place for dealing with Iran's nuclear capability. And so far, we're, we're a paper tiger to the Iranians, and that's unfortunate. The administration may soon shift toward a policy of containment, a strategy attempting to prevent Iran from using its weapons arsenal. Nuclear containment is not a wise policy. We've already seen Iran acting in a manner that is uncontained, specifically through its use of terrorism to wage war against the United States, against Israel, against other nations. It would be far better if we could stop the Iranian government from developing its nuclear weapons and further developing its missiles. You have to somehow have policies in place that question the legitimacy of the current regime and do more than question it, but pressure it into going out of business. For years, US lawmakers have employed sanctions against the Iranian regime. Sanctions have typically relied upon multilateral participation. And there are at least two permanent members, veto-wielding members of the Security Council, that are of a view that Iran is actually a client, not an enemy. Governments like Russia and China have their own interests in Iran, economic interests, uh, military and political interests. I think the Europeans clearly still see Iran as a big market. I think that's true for many businesses around the world. You have only to walk through Tehran's malls, stuffed with electronic goods from around the world, to get the point. U.S. sanctions have been in place for more than 26 years, with limited impact. The reason these countries and these companies continue to do business with Iran is they've never been put to a fundamental choice. You can either do business with Iran or you can do business with the United States, but you can't do both. It is an economic crisis that can help bring down this regime. We need what people have been speaking of, which is crippling sanctions. Extremely strong sanctions that would cut off essentially everything except food and pharmaceuticals and bare necessities of that sort. The majority of Americans support tough measures against Iran. The support for economic sanctions is overwhelming and it crosses party lines. In fact, the support for military strikes against Iran are surprisingly high. I don't think it's a matter of choosing between diplomacy or sanctions or military force. The right way to use any of these tools is when they are interwoven. If you can't come to agreement, it's likely there will be economic pressure, and if the economic pressure is not successful, then military force may be utilized. I have long hoped that it would be possible to bring down the Iranian regime without using military force. I fear we have squandered the time we had to effect that kind of change through non-military actions. There are those in the world who say, this is mainly Israel's problem. Israel will take care of it. We don't need to worry. Israel was created, among other things, to protect the Jewish people from future existential threats. Israel's Air Force conducted an enormous military training exercise earlier this month that could be seen as training for an attack deep inside Iran. If Israel feels compelled for reasons of self-preservation to mount an attack against Iran's nuclear weapons facilities, the United States will nevertheless be blamed for the Israeli attack, and the United States will be drawn into the aftermath of such an attack, no matter whether we were part of it at the beginning or not. What you see all too often is everybody wants Israel to do it, so the United States and the Western European allies don't have to do anything. That's a very poor mindset. I think it's important that Iran understand that U.S. military action is a very real option if we feel threatened. I think that's a very unattractive option, uh, but I think it's even more unattractive to contemplate uh, Iran with nuclear weapons. If all other options have, in fact, been exhausted, I think that the 
question is not simply what are the risks associated with acting militarily, but what are the risks associated with not acting? The people of Iran, clearly a majority of them, and perhaps a very substantial majority, have turned against the regime. The Iranian regime is very fragile at this point. Um, I don't think it can last forever. Uh, I don't know how long it can last. The regime is no longer legitimate in the eyes of the overwhelming majority of the Iranian people. Ahmadinejad is a laughing stock, and Khamenei's pictures are routinely burned and stomped on uh, demonstrations. They hate him. They call him a murderer. They chant death to the dictator. Iranians clashed, shouting death to the dictator, even taking over this police station at one point yesterday. In June of 2009, there was an election for president, which most Iranians believe was a hoax. The Iranian leadership, in particular Khamenei, simply didn't trust the system, and they cheated. We call it a coup against the votes of the people of Iran. Uh, and election coup. In scenes similar to 1979, millions of Iranians again took to the streets to voice their dissatisfaction with the rulers of Iran. The IRGC and the besiege were quickly deployed. Tens of thousands were arrested. Several hundred were killed. <laughs> One of those murdered was Neda Aga Sultan, a music student on the periphery of the demonstrations. Video of her death spread quickly throughout the world via YouTube and other social media. Whenever I see violence perpetrated on people who are peacefully dissenting, uh, and whenever the, the American people see that, uh, I think they're rightfully troubled. The Iranian people, with such a proud and ancient history, were hijacked by a bunch of extremists. The fact that the United States keeps giving in to Ahmadinejad is a signal to the Iranian people that the American policy is to support Ahmadinejad. It's not productive, given the history of U.S.-Iranian relations, to be seen as meddling, the U.S. president meddling in uh, Iranian elections. Well, the question is, should we have meddled in helping the dissidents of the Soviet Union. What is U.S. policy across the world? It's basically to always stand by the underdogs. At least make a stand, say a word. We should be supporting the anti-regime elements, those who are fighting for their freedom, those who have been dissidents, those who are marching in the streets, yelling, Obama, are you with us or against us? Ronald Reagan helped a lot with the collapse of the Soviet Union by calling them an evil empire and uh, saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It's very much in the interests of the people of Iran, as well as all of Iran's neighbors and us, for us to do everything humanly possible to get this regime to collapse uh, before it gets a nuclear weapon. It is in the interest of the international community and of the United States to lend all the support possible to the democratic movement inside Iran so that this regime will be changed as soon as possible. This is a question. Democracy inside Iran is a question now of international security. We have allowed them to believe that they can literally get away with murder. And now they are going to have the weapons of mass murder at their disposal. We should take this very seriously. قدرت پوشالی و سلطه شیطانی آمریکا بر جهان رو به نابودی است. We in the in the free nations of the world met many terrible challenges in the 20th century. But that's no guarantee that we will be successful this time as well. در همون دوران امام فرمود آمریکا هیچ غلطی نمی‌تواند بکند. We have to succeed. You know that that old tired adage failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. امروز 
سراسر ایران اسلامی از یک فریاد است و اون مرگ بر امریکا In the end, if the international community, if the United States will not form this resistance against the Iranian Khomeini's expansion, it will be too late. We will have to pay a much higher price. I'm talking about the entire humanity paying a much higher price to stop the threat. The situation is grave, and it affects us all. Time is running short. Now is the time for action. Americans, Iranians, and members of the free world now have a choice to stand idly by or to stand up and take part in Iran's new revolution.